So today I'll speak on the topic of God helps those who help themselves. And I will speak this in three parts. First part, I'll explain what this saying means and does not mean. Two common misunderstandings about this scene I'll saying I'll take. Then I will talk about some stories and incident from the Ramayana and some other illustrations for this. And then I will talk about how this principle applies in our life when we face different struggles or difficulties. So, <clears throat> God helps those who help themselves. A few months ago, I was in America and I was speaking at a university and then we were talking about meditation, I was talking about meditation and then one student asked this question that actually ultimately we have to help ourselves, that God helps those who help themselves. So what is the use of all this prayer, meditation, religion business? If we just do our work, then God will help us. We don't have to do any of this stuff. And if you just do all this stuff, but if we don't actually do our work, then is God going to help us? So I answered, yes, when we say God helps those who help themselves, what it means is not that we don't connect with God or that we only connect with God and don't do anything else. Both these are extremes. So one extreme which he was talking about is that, okay, if God is going to help us when we help ourselves, then that will mean that we don't have to do anything to connect with God at all. But we could add a sentence to this, God helps those who help themselves by letting God help them, by letting God help them. So the idea is that whenever we work in life, there are some things which are in our control and some things which are not in our control. And the main mood of this saying is that God helps those who help themselves. That means what is in our control, we need to do as well as we can. That is the way we are helping ourselves. And that which is not in our control, then God will take care of that. But we need to pray to God, we need to connect with God, we need to calm our consciousness by which we can do what is in our control to do. So if somebody thinks that, that A, I don't need to connect with God at all, then at one level they are presuming that they can control everything, but nobody can control everything. So therefore, the idea that we shouldn't connect with God at all, because for every, in every activity in life, there are factors beyond our control. Australia has probably one of the most aggressive cricket teams, if we consider sports like cricket. Now of course, some cricketers got into trouble because of that. but. Uh, even this, even in the Australian cricket team was its heydays when I mean, they were very aggressive and they were known for their <coughs> for their aggression on the field, for their sledging and other things. But even at that time, uh, many of the prominent Australian cricketers had their own peculiar superstitions. One of the Australian play batsmen, whenever he would go out to bat, before going out, first he would go to the pavilion's restroom and make sure that the lids of all the commodes would be closed. And if he got out early, he would not go back to the pavilion, he would go to the restroom. And if any of the commode lids would be open, he would go and blast his teammates. Why did you keep that open? Because of that I got out. <laughs> now you may say, it's crazy, what is the position of the commode lid got to do with this? There's another Australian cricketer who was a very good fielder and he practically never drop catches. He would, was all, all rounder also. So he would always have a handkerchief hanging out from his pocket and like half of it was out, half of it was inside. The very particular way he would put it there. And if any time he would drop the catch, he would never drop, but if he would drop the catch, 
Now, before looking at the ball, he will look at the handkerchief. Has it fallen off? How did I drop this catch? <laughs> so now, what are they doing by this? Actually, in sports, performance matters. Sports is hugely about performance. The players train and do workouts and they learn skills so that they can perform. But even in a performance driven activity like sports, performance is not all that matters. There are factors beyond the player's best performance that can also shape the results. A batsman may bat very well and may be leading the team to victory, but if the rain occurs at that time, what can the batsman do? So, factors beyond our control shape our every endeavor. And God helps those who help themselves. What it essentially means is that we acknowledge that there are factors beyond our control and they also need to work out favorably. Now, it's not only this, that the factors out of our control need to work out favorably and we pray to God to take care of those factors. But it's also that when we connect with God, we get a little more calmness, little more clarity, little more confidence. And even the factors that are in our control, we can do them better. Otherwise, if we are agitated, we can't even do the things which we could do. So, the, the idea is that when we, as I said, God helps those who help themselves by letting God help them. That means that when we connect with Krishna through prayer, through meditation, through worship, that calms us. And Tesham Satata Yuktanam Bhajitam Preeti Purvakam Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam Yenamam Upayantite. Krishna says, Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam. I will give you the intelligence by which you can take proper decisions, by which you can come to me. So, this is what Krishna will give us when we connect with Him. Because that's when our consciousness becomes receptive to his guidance. So that's the, uh, the idea that we don't need God at all. That's not the main implication of this verse. Now, the other misunderstanding about this could also be that actually, or other that you know, we don't need to do anything at all. And all that we need to do is just worship God and he will take care of everything. That is also not the mood of the Bhagavad Gita, if you see. The Bhagavad Gita describes how Arjun at the end has picked up his bow in readiness to fight. So, Arjun is going to do his part. And once Arjun does his part, then Krishna will do his part also. So, if somebody has the idea that, okay, we don't, know to, don't need to do anything at all, that's also a misunderstanding. That certainly we need to do our part and that is the stress. God helps those who help themselves. So we help ourselves by accessing God's help, by opening our heart to God's help. And that is our endeavor. Now if you consider the famous verse in the Bhagavad Gita which says, Prakrte kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha ahankara vimudhatma karta aham iti manyate Well, in 3.27 the Gita says that karta aham iti manyate One who thinks I am the doer, that person is actually an illusion. But at the same time, the Bhagavad Gita also tells Arjun at the end, Vimrishaita Dashe Shena Yathe Chasitha Akuru, that was 3.27, this is 18.63. Now deliberate and do as you desire. So do. For earlier, the Bhagavad Gita seems to have said that if you think you are the doer, you are an illusion. But now Krishna is telling you, contemplate and you do what you want to do. Do as you desire. And at the end, Arjuna says, Karishe Vachinam Tava in 18.73, I will do your will. So now again it's do, Karishe. So what is going on here? If Krishna is telling Arjuna that one who thinks that they are doers are illusion, an illusion, but then he's telling Arjuna, now you do as you desire, and Arjuna is saying, I will do. So what is going on over here is that Krishna is calling as illusion one who thinks that they are the soul doers. In 18th chapter 16th verse, Krishna says that Tatraivam sati kartaram atmanam kevalam tu yaha pashyatya krita buddhitvan nasa pashyati durmatihi That one who thinks Tatraivam sati kartaram atmanam 
kevalam tu yaha. Kartaram means one who is a doer. And atma naam kevala. One who thinks I alone am the doer. Nasa pashyati durmatihi. Such a person is not able to see properly. Their vision is misdirected. So we are definitely the doers, but we are not the sole doers. So we have a role to play in whatever action we do, but it's only one part. And that's why Krishna also says in 2.47, Karmanne vadhi karaste, ma faleshu kadachana ma karma falahe turbhur, ma te sangosta karmani. He says, do not be attached to the fruits of result because do not think of yourself as the producer of the result. Our actions are important, but our actions alone don't produce the result. Things in our control, we may do well, but things beyond our control also have to work well. And that's when the result will come out. So, Krishna doesn't definitely ask us to do what is in our control. So, the mood of this verse is, the, of this saying, God helps those who have, that have helped themselves is that, we do our part well, and then we pray to God so that what is not in our control will also work out. And that's how results will come out. That's how success will come out. So any comments or questions about this till now? Okay. So now this is illustrated on many occasions. I'll talk about an occasion where somebody had a lot of initiative and somebody had very little initiative. So when we talk about things in our control and things out of our control, sometimes a lot is in our control and sometimes very little is in our control. In every situation, we focus on what is in our control. In the Mahabharata, there is the story of Arjun deciding on the 14th day of the Kurukshetra war to bring down Jayadrath. Now, why did he want to bring down Jayadrath specifically? Does anyone know? Yes, well, Arjun had been, Jayadrath had been responsible for the death of Abhimanyu. Although Jayadrath had not personally killed him, but Jayadrath had intervened in the help reaching him. So then, what are the specific vow that Arjun took? Yes, before sunset, I will either bring Jaidra down or I will, I will myself enter fire, fire. So that was his way. So he took a very fierce vow. And at that time, then initially when Jaidra heard about it, he became terrorized, terrified. And he came to Duryodhana and he said, Look, O oh Prince, I am going, I am running away to the Himalayas, I am going to hide over there. I will run so far that Arjun will not be able to reach me. Assure me of my safety, otherwise I am going. Now Duryodhan, with his evil brain, he thought there is an opportunity over here. He says, if we can, today we got Arjun's son, tomorrow we can get Arjun also. So he said, don't worry, we will arrange the whole army to protect you. And they arranged the entire army. Uh, was array. So, it was almost like a 20 mile distance between Arjun and the next day start and Jayadrath. And not just 20 mile distance, but it was an army arranged throughout. And Arjun just penetrated into it. Drona himself challenged him right at the head, but Arjun dodged Drona and went ahead. Krishna told him, don't entangle, don't entangle yourself with Drona right now. And then as Arjun broke a path through that ocean of soldiers, relentlessly moving on and on and on and on. Every single Kaurav warrior who came along the way was sidelined, was knocked down. And even Duryodhan himself came. Duryodhan of course was no match to Arjun. He was wounded and sat beside. And eventually Arjun just marched on and on and on. Yudhishthira became worried that Arjun is alone. Yesterday Abhimanyu was alone in the Kaurav army where Arjun is alone. So he told Arjuna's friend and student, Satyaki, to go with him. And Satyaki went there. And then Ayudhishthira started thinking that Satyaki is all alone. Satyaki is also young like Abhimanyu. So, what, so let somebody else go. And then Bhima went inside. And Bhima was just itching for a fight. And Bhima, just in a few hours, 
uh, as he followed the trail of devastation that Arjun had wrought, he, the, he just devastated everyone who tried to stop him. And eventually within a short while, he finished off 30 of Duryodhana's brothers. And this day turned out to be like one of the worst days for the Kauravas. And And as, Duryo, as Duryodhana was horrified, he, what is happening? Nobody is able to stop Arjun. So suddenly he looked up and says, maybe, maybe Krishna is God. He said, otherwise how is it possible for one warrior to penetrate through our whole entire army and reach up to us? And then, Really, Krishna is God. How can I fight against him? What is the chance of victory in a battle against God? However, he was so determined to fight. Krishna ultimately responds with our desires. He was looking around gloomily and he saw the sun sinking towards the horizon. And suddenly, a thought came to his mind if Krishna is God, now Krishna loves Arjun and Arjun loves Abhiman, Arjun loved Abhimanyu. So if Krishna were God, Krishna would surely have protected the son of his devotee. The fact that I was able to kill Abhimanyu means that Krishna is not God. <laughs> and therefore I can fight. And immediately he called. He said yesterday we had six commanders attacking Abhimanyu. Now, Arjun is far better than everyone knew, so we will have eight warriors attacking him simultaneously. So, he said that Drona and Krupa, you hold him from the front. He said, Karana and Ashwatthama, you attack him from the side. Then he said, Shalya and Shakuni, you attack him from the other side. He said, I and Dushasan will attack him from the behind. And they all suddenly swooped down on Arjun. And Arjun in the distance could see Jayadrath's chariot, the its own standard, its own flag. So he was almost there. But suddenly, it's like a ocean of arrows started coming on him from all sides. He started fighting, trying to swirling round and round and round, spinning around, shooting arrows so fast. And when he was taking out the arrow, when he was placing it on his bow and shooting, nobody could see. But despite that blinding speed which he was countering, because so fierce was the attack that Arjun could just barely hold his position. He couldn't even move, he couldn't even see clearly. And Arjun was also conscious that the sun is sinking. Like in today's example, it's like a final over of a cricket match. And the key batsman, there's some other batsman who's a, not a very good batsman, the non-strikers, he's on the strikers and the key batsman is the non-strikers. You know, the, the batter just play and get me on strike. But ball after ball after ball is going. And this batsman is what this good batsman is watching, but not getting the strike only. So Arjun was not getting an opportunity to strike at all. Just, it was just everything was just being blocked. So at that time, so close and yet so far. And as Arjun started despairing, at that time, Krishna saw his devotee in trouble. Arjun had done everything possible for him. He had helped himself in every way possible. And yet suddenly at this last moment, the attack was overwhelming. So Krishna immediately raised his hand and the Sudarshan Chakra appeared. Because there was so much action going on all around, nobody noticed it. And Krishna just flung the Sudarshan Chakra. And it went high into the sky and it went and covered the sun. Now, some people say that was the exact time when an eclipse occurred, a solar eclipse occurred. But the warriors were fighting, they were expecting sunset and suddenly the darkness enveloped the field. And immediately the Kaurava started cheering, jumping, enjoy. And Jayadra had been hiding behind fearfully all this time. Suddenly came forward and he started mocking 
Arjun, he said, you are going to kill me? Now I will light your fire for you, pyre for you and you will enter into it. Now Arjun was confounded and dejection said putting down his bow and Krishna spoke in a very urgent tone without looking back at him. He said, Arjun, there is still time. Just place the Brahmastra on your bow and point it towards Jayadrath. Now Arjun knew that there are certain times when no questions are to be asked. <laughs> so if Krishna is telling me something must be going on over here. And then he said that hit Jayadrath's head in such a way that Jayadrath's head will not fall on the ground. It will go several miles away from here. His father. father is sitting in meditation and let this go and fall on his father's lap. Let the head. So Arjun took the bow, raised it, put the Brahmastra and shot the arrow. And as he was about to pull the string, Krishna removed the Sudarshan Chakra. And the last rays of the sun started streaming across the battlefield. And the Kauravas were shocked. What happened? But even before they could react, Arjuna had shot the arrow. And Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, do not be dejected amidst distress and do not be elated amidst success, amidst happiness. With the Pandavas, the Kauravas got so elated amidst success, amidst happiness, that they lowered their guard. And when they lowered their guard, immediately they were caught napping. Krishna did not let Arjun get dejected amidst success. And Arjun shot the arrow and right in front of everyone's eyes, the arrow just went straight and decapitated. Jayadras and Jayadras had swept through the air far into the sky. And Rudakshatra, Jayadras' father was sitting in meditation. And he knew that his son was evil minded. And yet he had a parental attachment to his son. So he had prayed to the gods and got a benediction that anyone who causes his son's head to fall on the ground, that person, his own head will crack into a thousand pieces. So Jaidra's head came, head came flying through the air and fell on Rudakshatra's lap. And Rudakshatra was in meditation. He opened his eyes and looked down, saw this bleeding head, just got up and pushed it away. And as soon as he pushed away the head, it fell on the ground. And the moment it fell on the ground, boom! So by the boon that he had sought, he was killed. So this is what you call the boomerang effect. <laughs> what the demons try to use to attack the devotees, that very thing backfires against them. That very thing damages and destroys them. So in this case, as the Pandava, as the Kaurava is just shake, shocked and shaken and shattered, Arjun and Krishna embraced each other. And Arjun celebrated the fulfillment of his vow. So here we see this dynamic. God helps those who help themselves. Arjun helped himself to the fullest capacity, exerting as much as he could to get to Jayadrath. But when in the final lap, it was not possible for him to go any further. Krishna helped him at that time. So this is the mood. Now in Arjun's case, he was a warrior. He was an extremely skilled archer, the supermost archer of his times. And he fought to his fullest potential. So, another, so he did all he could. In the Ramayana, we see another situation where actually... There is other extreme where what was in control was very little. When, the, when they were in exile, at that time Ravan heard about Sita's beauty and decided to carry her away. And he made a whole conspiracy to abduct her. And he got through Maricha Ram sidelined and then Lakshman went there. And then he came in and swooped, first sneaked in and then swooped down on Sita. And he abducted her. And as she was being abducted, now she, Ravan was a 
fierce, powerful, brutal demon. And her strength was no match to his. Uh, and as she was dragging him away, she called, calling for help, help. And then she saw Jatayu over there. And Jatayu also saw Sita. And as soon as Sita saw Jatayu, she understood that Jatayu is old. He will not be, he'll not be any match to Ravan. She, so she told him immediately, oh, Jatayu, please don't try to stop Ravan. Just tell Ram that, he has, that Ravan has abducted me. And Ram will come and find me. Now, Jatayu had that easy way out. So Sita only told me, don't do anything. But Jatayu could not live with himself if he allowed Sita to go away like that. Jatayu naturally assumed like a parental role. Jatayu and Dashtoth were friends. So when uh, they had come to the Tataka, uh, the, to the Dandakawa forest, at that time Jata, they had met Jatayu and Jatayu had said, I will help in protecting Sita. So Jatayu fought fiercely, but he didn't have age on his side. Ravan was young, where Jatayu was old. And eventually his wings were lopped off and Jatayu fell. And Sita ran to comfort Jatayu, to help him in his pain. But Sita was dragged by Ravan and they started flying again. Now, now Sita, she could have gone, she could have crumbled under this. First of all, Ravan had abducted her and, and then Jatayu had also been wounded and probably killed in trying to protect her. She has been calling out frantically for Ram and Lakshman. Nobody was coming. And sometimes when a bad thing happens to us and everything that we do, nothing seems to be helping. It is very easy to just sink into helplessness, sink into depression, sink into agony. And it's even worse if we have ourselves made a mistake that has contributed to it. Now, for Sita, when Lakshman had told her that you know Ram is not in danger, Maricha was imitating Sita's Ram's voice, says Ram cannot be in any danger. So Lakshman was not ready to go, but Sita goaded her with very harsh words. He says, You have an evil eye on me. You want me it for yourself, that's why you're not going. And Lakshman couldn't bear these words. And he said to Sita with folded hands, you don't folded hands, you don't know what you are saying. But the words you are saying, I cannot bear them. And he left. So now when we ourselves make a mistake, which also compounds the situation, then we can also start beating ourselves up. So that makes us even more incapable of doing anything. Yes, if we have made a mistake, we have to acknowledge that. There is a difference between taking responsibility and blaming, even blaming oneself. <laughs> taking responsibility is, okay, I am a responsible human being, but here I made a bad choice. Here I made a bad decision. And I, I I'll accept the consequences and I will not do it again. That is taking responsibility. But blaming oneself means, that one just takes that incident like a stick and keeps beating oneself. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? And sometimes people have, people start actually loathing themselves. There is self-loathing or self-hatred. It's, it's a problem for many people because they had certain goals, they had certain expectations and they're not able to live up to it because of whatever reason. Then they start beating themselves up. And that's terrible. Now, Sita could have been beating herself up for her mistake. Sita could be beating her fate. You know, why did this demon have to come and <coughs> kill, uh, come and abduct me like this? But, you know, even when nothing is in our control, some things are always in our control. As Ravan was taking her through the sky, she was calling out, help, help. And she looked down and she saw some strange looking beings over there. And she looked carefully, they looked like a cross between humans and monkeys. Who were they? The Vanaras. So, there was Sugriva, there was Hanuman, and there were a couple of other Vanaras. 
So when <laughs> she saw them, she called out and they looked up at her. But Ravana was going so fast that the Manaras couldn't do anything and he was high up in the sky. So, but she saw that they looked up kindly at her. Although, kind, although helpless, but still they had a kind look on their, about them. So immediately, Sita felt, I should do something. So, Ravana was marching through the sky, she immediately loosened some of her ornaments and dropped them. And what was she doing by that? She was giving a clue for Ram to find her. So, even in her helpless situation, she did what she could. And by that, immediately as those ornaments fell down, Sugriva and Hanuman went, found the ornaments and they kept them safely. And later on, when Ram was searching for Sita, he came there and he told Sugriva about what had happened. And Sugriva immediately brought out the ornaments. Ram broke down on seeing those ornaments. But from that emerged a greater eagerness in him. That, because when Sita had been abducted, he didn't even know whether Sita was alive or dead. But when he knew that Sita had been going all along the way, then he understood that demon had not just taken Sita to devour her, not to kill her. He wanted her alive. That means she would probably be alive still. And thus, Sita, even within her constrained situation, did what she could to help herself. And the clue that she kept, Ram found it and eventually Ram found her also. So for each one of us, sometimes the situation may be so constricted that we feel, what can I do in this situation? That I am so helpless, there is nothing I can do. So this is the second point I told till now, these two stories, from one from Ramayana and one from Mahabharat. And then, now I am coming to the last point. The last point is, how does this apply in our lives? Sometimes we may feel that there is nothing in my control. Mm. Now, when we feel like that, we can ask ourselves a question. How many of you have felt a situation like this in your life sometime, when nothing seems to be in your control and everything is going wrong? Yes. yes. Okay, all of us have felt that. <laughs> no, nothing seems to be in our control. Now, when we feel like this, nothing is in my control, you can just turn around and ask yourself. You know, no matter how bad things are, can we make them worse? I mean, what kind of question is this? <laughs> but it's a serious question. No matter how bad things are, can we make them worse? Yes. yes. No matter how bad things are, we can always make them worse. You know, I might get a fracture and I might be on bed, immobilized. I may feel I'm helpless. But while I'm on my bed, my, my foot is fractured. Now I can take that same foot and hit a bat on it <laughs> and that can make it infinitely worse. So the point I'm making over here is, it's a counterintuitive point that no matter how bad things are, we can always make them worse. And that means we are not entirely powerless. If we can make things worse, that means we can make things better also. That feeling that I am completely powerless is what makes us powerless. But by this shock exercise, can I make things worse? No, no matter what situation we are in, we can surely make things worse. No doubt about it. So if we can make things worse, that means we are not powerless. And if we have the power to make things worse, we can also have the power to make things better. And what does it mean the power to make things better? See, at one level, even if everything else is out of our control, our own consciousness and our presence of mind, they are always in our control. When things go out of our control, if our mind gets attached to those things and mind starts worrying, this is out of control, that is out of control, that is out of control, that is out of control. Then by that, if we keep thinking, thinking of the things that are out of control, our mind also goes out of control. And that's what makes things worse. But if we can keep our mind in control, if we can calm ourselves down, then we can look for some opportunity even in that situation. 
and for this when very little seems to be in our control one when we are going through bad times when we are going through unmanageably bad times we need to divide our frame of reference to manageable units of time i'll repeat this that when we are going through unmanageably bad times we need to reduce our frame of reference to manageable units of time what do i mean by reduce our frame of reference say if you go, if you have fallen terribly sick now say we got a fracture and we are immobilized and then if we start thinking oh you know oh, if i can never walk again if i always stay on bed what will i do How, after one month what will happen after six months what will happen after one year what will happen well don't think about one month six months one year because when things are out of control there are too many vari variables and thinking there is a time to think long term but there is a time to think short term also so at that time just think in terms of one day or if not one day just think in terms of one hour in the next one hour can i do something by which i will not make things worse can i not mess up things for the next one hour yes i can can i make things can i act in a proper way responsible way see all of us know most of the times when we are responding wrongly see if bad things have happened to us and then we start behaving badly with others we start becoming rude we start becoming short tempered we know that we are not behaving properly but we it's we ourselves feel so burdened we ourselves feel so crushed that somehow somehow we want to vent things out but the problems of today can always be dealt with today it is only when on top of the problems of today we put the problems of yesterday and the problems of tomorrow then even the problems of today seem unbearable it's like say if we have this carousel where we get the baggage claim now in the baggage claim there will be 100 bags over there and our bag comes we pick our bag and we can walk but before our bag comes if we start picking up all the previous bags also put them on our trolley and then our bag comes and after that we keep keeping other bags also and so one bag on the trolley there are 25 bags and then we try to push that trolley it will be impossible isn't it so just take out our bag so similarly just focus on the problems of today okay yesterday's problems okay there's a later time if something could be done about it we'll do it now few tomorrow's problems when they come we'll deal with it so just reduce your frame of reference to manageable units now can i act maturely for this one day today yes i can we always have that capacity so when we do this then we will ensure that we won't take at least we'll ensure that we don't make things worse and not only that if we start doing what we can step by step by step small steps at a time that will also help us and as we said small things right keep doing small things right eventually nothing stays bad permanently the pleasures of the world are temporary and the troubles of the world are also temporary sometimes we feel there is a dark the total darkness in our life even if the darkness is there the darkness is never like a dungeon the darkness is like a tunnel it now when we are in the dark we may we can't make any difference is it a tunnel or is it a dungeon especially the end of the tunnel is far away both may appear to be equally dark but the difference is a dungeon it's closed from all sides but a tunnel there is a path just keep walking on the path walking on the path the tunnel will end there will be light there will be light at the end of the tunnel so similarly when we divide our unmanageable problem into manageable units of time okay this darkness i don't know how far it is but for this one day can i walk steadily in this darkness yes i can if one step one step one step 
just do it one step at a time and if you do it eventually you will find that the darkness will get over and this is where our devotion can play a very big role i'll conclude, I'll conclude this point that this is that generally in the materialistic world view we think there are only two options either everything is in my control or nothing is in my control but in the spiritual world view we are, now of course in the, in the materialistic world view we know everything is never in my control we only imagine it actually sometimes if everything is working nicely we say it's like a dream but the funny thing is even in our dreams everything is not in our control isn't it even in our dream some things happen which are not in our control so actually everything is never in our control but we basically think of things in two perspectives either things are in my control or things are out of my control but in a spiritual world view we understand that even when things are out of my control they are not out of control they are under some higher control there is a higher plan and by that plan things will work out positively so uh, everything that happens is not necessarily good bad things do happen some people have this geeta sar in their homes and one of the sentences in geeta sar is jo hua wo acha hua jo ho raha hai wo bhi acha ho raha hai jo hone wala hai wo bhi acha hi hoga now you know i have recited the gita thousands of times read the gita dozens of times but i have never found any verse close to this <laughs> there's nothing like this in the gita at all so something that is not present in the gita how can that be the essence of the gita it is a good sounding saying but the essence of the gita is not about what is happening to us the essence of the gita is what we are going to do but arjuna was undecided and arjuna became decided about what to do so to say that everything that happens is good it might sound good but it's not exactly good if somebody somebody starts drinking and becomes alcoholic is that good that's bad if somebody drives drunk and kills someone is that good that's horrible now there's a difference that everything that happens may not be good but everything that happens can be for good can be for good means bad things may happen and we can't imagine bad things to be good some things are bad but from the bad good may emerge and that's why even when things appear to be completely out of control for us there could be a higher plan that is still operating and by that higher plan things will work out so when we have this bhakti understanding that krishna is ultimately in control and even through bad things good can emerge then we don't get overwhelmed or completely knocked down by the bad things okay this bad thing has happened let me not make the bad thing worse let me respond as positively as i can so if we do that then we play our part so if there is something we can do to help ourselves we do that so if we do our part then god will help us in ways we can see and in ways we can't see also so we seek help wherever it is available and we do it in a prayerful mood and wherever thing we can't see we just hand it over to god and by this way when we work then the darkness will end and they will eventually come to the light at the end of the tunnel so god helps those who help themselves by letting god help them that is indeed the theme of the bhagavad gita's conclusion where krishna says arjuna yatra yogeshvara krishno yatra partho dhanurdara tatra shrir vijayo bhutir ruvani tirma tirma ma this is wherever there is krishna and where there is arjuna there is god helping and there is arjuna also helping himself both of them are together krishna says there will be success over there so i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke on this theme of god helps those who help themselves and i started one one misconception people may have that means we just have to do ourselves everything and 
then God will help us. We don't have to do anything at all to connect with God or to pray to God. That's not the idea because no matter how how well prepared we are, how well we do our work, everything is never in our control. So for success, things in our control have to be done right and things out of our control also have to work out right. In sports, performance matters, but performance is not all that matters. There are uh, other things also, so say, say the weather and conditions and so many other factors. So now the mood of this is that when we help ourselves, that means we do our part well and then that which is beyond our control will be taken care of. Krishna, when Krishna says to think ourselves of as uh, think of ourselves as doers is an illusion, that doesn't mean we are not meant to do. We surely have to do, but we have to do our part recognizing that we are not the sole doers. So this idea that we don't have to do anything uh, to connect with God, this often arises from a misconception about religion or devotion that those who are devotees do nothing except praying to God. No, there is a, we pray to God, at the same time we do our part also responsibly. And for this I discussed two stories, which were the two stories? Jayadrat and Sita, yes. And in both of them this theme is that God helps those who help themselves. But in the case of Arjun, there is a lot in his control and he did everything he could. But when he fell short, Krishna helped. In the case of Sita, there is very little in control for her. And yet she did what he could. Even when it, rather than beating ourselves for our own mistakes, rather than blaming the situations, we can look at what we can do in that situation. When we feel that I am completely powerless, we can ask the counterintuitive question. Things are very bad, can I make them worse? If I can, that means I am not powerless. And then we can do our small part to make them better. At the very least, our own consciousness is always in our control. Our presence of mind is in our control. If we keep thinking of the things that are out of control, then our consciousness also goes out of, our mind also goes out of control and we become helpless. But instead of thinking of the things out of control, we think of Krishna. We pray to Krishna. That will help us understand that even through this chaos, some higher plan is operating. Bad things can happen, but good can come from the bad. Everything that happens may not be good, but everything that happens can be for good. And then with that, understanding that there can be a higher plan operating, then what can we do? We can see that this dark phase that I am going through, it may be extremely dark, but it is not going to last forever. It is not a dungeon, it is a, it is a tunnel. And then when we face unmanageable problems, or when we go through unmanageably bad times, we can decrease our frame of reference to manageable units of time. That we Don't think about what will happen after one month, three months, six months, one year. Just focus right now on one day. The problems of today are always manageable today. Provided we don't pile the problems of the past and the future of yesterday and tomorrow. We just have to take our suitcase from the carousel, not all the other suitcases over there. And when we act in this way, uh, then we will find that not only will Krishna bring good out of the bad, but Krishna will also guide us to keep taking small, small steps positively. And by that, we will emerge from the dark phases. When we help ourselves, by connecting with Krishna and doing our part in his service. Krishna will help us in ways we can foresee and even in ways that we can't foresee. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes. In this example of Krishna helping Arjuna, hmm. can we frame in Kajendra Moksha here to like say, Gajendra was in the beginning at one extreme, like believing on its, its own strength. As time moved on, it started to surrender to the Lord. Mm. So, does it fit or because good example. more of a surrenderingness? A good example. See, if we say Gajendra Moksha, can we say that he was initially at one extreme saying, I will try my everything and then at the end, he just surrendered to Krishna. 
yes you could say it that way but even surrender also requires trying if it just given up he actually didn't give up he actually looked up normally when we give up it is just that we sink in self self pity and then we just become dejected so in a sense he didn't give up he gave up to look up and to call out to the lord and that requires endeavor also so in bhakti there is a dual dynamic that there is dependence on krishna and there is also diligence for krishna and both are integral to devotion so for the things that are in our control we need to have diligence to do them as well as we can when arjun was practicing archery he would practice painstakingly all day he would learn all night he would practice that's how he became the champion archer that's how he got the name gudakesh so at that time he was not thinking no oh i'll shoot the arrow krishna you make it hit the target you make it hit the target not like that he he was practicing painstakingly and that diligence was also his devotion so for the things that are in our control we need to be diligent and for the things that are not in our control we need to be dependent and sometimes in some situations we may think that this situation is in my control now then we may keep trying 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 and eventually we realize that it's not in our control and then we may surrender to krishna so it's a is if you consider there are draupadi was also in similar situation she was trying to protect herself and she couldn't protect she surrendered to krishna by raising her hands but there's a big difference between draupadi's consciousness and gajendra's consciousness gajendra was completely in an enjoying mentality at that time he was out there in the in the lake for a picnic Draupadi throughout was in a dharmic consciousness. Now she was trying to persuade everyone to see dharma. How can you let an atrocity like this happen? And she was trying to reason with them. What is the dharma over here? If Yudhishthira had already gambled himself, and how could he have gambled me? So it was not that Draupadi was not surrendered before. It was out of her surrender itself that she was trying to. stay off that calamity so it is not that arjun was not surrendered when he was fighting so gajendra was in materialistic consciousness and that emergency put him in spiritual consciousness hmm. but with respect to arjun or draupadi throughout they were in devotional consciousness only but so they were do, having in devotional consciousness diligence for krishna but while uh, while doing their best in a mood of devotion with diligence for krishna at a particular point they found with all their diligence it was not enough then they shifted to dependence on krishna so in that sense gajendra's evolution is from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness whereas draupadi or arjuna it is always spiritual consciousness but from diligence in spiritual consciousness to dependence in spiritual consciousness so in that sense it's a different journey it's not a similar situation so for all of us we may sometimes be caught in in the doership mentality i can do it and we don't even think of krishna but then when things don't work then when we we become humble and we pray to krishna so we often usually go go from uh, go from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness like gajendra but at the same time in the name of we shouldn't think that in the name of dependence on krishna we don't do our part well about 28 20 now 20 years ago so when i started giving classes for the first time spiritual classes so uh, uh, i was given about 10 guidelines about how to speak in public for krishna and the last guideline was depend on krishna <laughs> but in bracket depend on krishna but only after you have prepared 
<laughs> so if i don't prepare for a class and i say i'm dependent on krishna that is not dependence that is irresponsibility so for each one of us uh, we shouldn't think that dependence on krishna is the same as irresponsibility it's not we have to be extremely responsible to do what we can but we also try to have a consciousness of service that is not i who am the doer krishna i am doing this for your pleasure and it is you who will enable me to do it krishna says paurusham drushu he says i am ability in people so even when we are able to do something with our own abilities our abilities are not ours actually they are actually our abilities are not our entitlements they are our endowments they have been given to us gifted to us so we if we are in material consciousness like gajendra uh, help helplessness inducing situations can take us towards spiritual consciousness and that is good but in normal when we are doing service we shouldn't think that when i am doing service i am in material consciousness we try to be in devotional consciousness by being diligent for krishna and with diligence if sometimes things don't work out then we shift towards dependence okay thank you any other questions yes please good question so like bhishma all despite being a devotee chose the wrong side and sometimes we also despite knowing what is right chose the wrong side so what do we learn from our role role how can we learn from our role models properly first of all a very important principle to understand is everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture everything in scripture is not the teaching of scripture scripture has a descriptive section and a prescriptive section description means these were this is how things were at that time now but that doesn't mean necessarily mean this is how we should act so that is just description and then there is prescription prescription is this is how you should act so to give another example some people say yudhishthir was dharmaraj and he gambled so why should we gamble why can't we gamble but if you see the thrust of the mahabharat is yudhishthir was dharmaraj but still when he got into gambling he was so caught by the fever of gambling that he lost everything now we are nowhere as dharmic as yudhishthir if we get into the grip of gambling the fever of gambling will be ruined completely so yudhishthir's gambling is not prescriptive it is descriptive and the prescription is not to be gamble not to gamble but to to not gamble because it's so it's so dangerous so similarly with respect to bhishma he is a great devotee but the at the same time the mahabharat does not idealize its characters that means there are great characters but also they may sometimes have some limitations now the the epics the mahabharat ramayana and other epics madhvacharya says in his brahma sutra bhashya is commentary on the vedanta sutra that they can be understood at multiple levels we can take them at literal level this is what happened just hear it relish it and you will get purified the other is at a ethical level ethical level means that we look at it from ethical perspective this was the situation this person acted like this and this was a wrong action and we should not act like this or we should act like this so at the literal level if we take it we just say everything is orchestrated by the lord it is the lord's leela and we just hear it and relish it that's one way of looking at it that's perfectly valid from that perspective whatever bhishma did was also a part of the lord's plan and bhishma acted in that way 
because the lord ultimately wanted to demonstrate that especially he remained silent when draupadi was being disrobed so uh, uh, he did not protest he did not oppose strongly at least because the lord wanted to demonstrate that even when we have many protectors we may end up with no protector except him and later on when bhishma fought against the pandavas so bhishma was was a warrior who had been trained by the greatest warrior parashuram in warfare and he had been trained by the great sages in shastra so he was expert in shastra and shastra and yet when he chose the side against god he was going to be ruined he was defeated he was defeated so the point which is being taught at the transcendental level at the lila perspective is that no matter how great a person may be if they choose the wrong side they will perish now having said this at the ethical perspective if you see then <clears throat> bhishma was what you could call a literalist in some ways literalist means he would always stick to the literal word of the law so sometimes he said that the stick to the letter of the spirit letter of the law and not to understand the spirit of the law so it's important to understand rules in the context of the purpose of the rules so sometimes if you just stick to the rule and forget the purpose then we may get lost that means see the rule is like the is like the road and the purpose is like the compass which tells us the direction now so now normally we take a road and by that road we get going the say if i want to go eastwards i take a road this is going eastward and i i get to the eastern direction but suppose that road takes a u turn and if i stay on following that road then i will end up going in the direction opposite to what i wanted to go so we have to follow the rule but we also have to remember the purpose of the rule and see whether the following following the rule is serving the purpose of the rule otherwise the road might be having u turn so now he had taken a vow that i will always be i will always fight on the side of the kuru ruler and the purpose of that was to protect the kuru dynasty but now when the kuru dynasty was itself being destroyed because a evil member of the kuru dynasty uh, was had gained power unscrupulously then if he had kept his purpose in mind it is to protect the kuru dynasty not just stand by the kuru ruler so he if he had he if he had not fought then the chance of duryodhana going against the pandavas was lesser so what happens is the mahabharat does not idealize its characters and krishna does not overlook a devotee if a devotee commits mistakes krishna does not overlook that devotee's devotion because of the mistakes or you made a mistake so your devotion is of no use but at the same time we can't assume that just because we are a devotee and we have committed a mistake it is not that krishna will overlook our mistakes and just look at our devotion mistakes at a material level may have consequences so say suppose if somebody has diabetes and they eat a lot of sweets saying this is prasad well it is prasad <laughs> but all the other food items are also prasad <laughs> why are you specially attracted to this so we say eating prasad will purify but if i am taking sweets and my body is vulnerable to sweets then it will have a consequence at the material level so if we commit mistakes they will also have consequences so bhishma exemplifies what is called as niyamagraha niyamagraha means sticking to the letter of the law without understanding its purpose and without pursuing its purpose so some mahabharat commentators say that that bhishma had to get that extremely painful situation before death very much so many arrows pierced his body and he was lying on the arrow bed so that was like a uh, something which he had to go through because he neglected his duty because he did not protect draupadi as a kshatriya because he fought on the side of the kauravas of course because he has been a devotee 
so krishna blessed him so that he did not feel the pain at that time krishna raised his consciousness to a spiritual level so in that sense it's not just simply karma coming over there it is krishna's plan happening over there so we shouldn't take the wrong example from scripture as a we have the other example of vibhishan so vibhishan was on ravana's side but he chose to come on ram's side if we can't if we also have another example of vidura <coughs> vidura decided i can't fight on the kaurava side but he did not go to the pandava side he went on the pilgrimage and in that case he did that because in the ramayana the main villain was himself vibhishan vibhishan's brother and he was irredeemable he was but in the case of uh, mahabharat dhritarashtra was not like a very bad person he was attached to a bad person so if vidura had gone to the pandava side and fought against the kauravas and vidura had been a party in the death of dhritarashtra's sons then dhritarashtra would have had so much anger towards him that he would not have been able to hear from vidura so vidura just went away didn't take sides over there and later on when he came back and instructed dhritarashtra dhritarashtra could hear from him and could gain detachment and enlightenment thereby so we may have to if we have to take sides in a conflict and we know which is right then we needn't take bhishma follow bhishma as a model we can follow vibhishan or vidura as a model okay thank you yes any other question yeah please Okay. Okay, good question. So how does this quote fit in with Ram himself and God help those who have themselves? Actually when Ram descends to this world, he or in general when the avatars descend to the world, they don't always act as if they are God. They often act like human beings. So in fact the every every book has its driving question so for the mahabharata the question is what is dharma for the bhagavatam the question is what is dharma of a person about to die the ramayana's driving question is what are the characteristics of an ideal person so now if that ideal person is god then god doesn't have any temptations god doesn't have any problems god can always act ideally so the uh, epic the ramayana doesn't emphasize so much on ram's divinity although it's, it's there very much it's the awareness is there but it's it's not uh, emphasis and the beauty of the ramayana is that ram himself goes through difficulties and he doesn't use his omnipotence to push off difficulties rather he demonstrates how one can respond to adversity with dignity by sticking to one's duty in various great difficulties and that's what makes the ramayana so inspiring so in ram's case if we see so he is acting like a ideal human being an ideal human being means he tries his best in every situation and because he's in a human role so there are you could say that there are things as human being not in his control they are not ultimately not they are ultimately in his control but in the leela they are not in his control and that's how he acts and then for that for the things that are not in his control he seeks help so he does what he is find looking for sita himself but then he takes he forms alliances with the vanaras so now for him to actually if you if you want to take it from if he's like a human being playing that nara leela then for him to actually meet to first of all after sita is lost to find jatayu itself is special you know there's a big a big forest could be anywhere but he find jatayu and jatayu told that ravana has taken her and then he moves on and then then he found finds that demon kabanda and then kabanda tells him after he he, he delivers kabanda he tells him 
to find the formal alliance with sugriva and then he goes to sugriva so we see that there are things beyond his knowledge his capacity that are also helping him to make things work out so in that sense he is also in, if we consider narlila that is big also demonstrated over there when the vanaras whom ram has sent even for them also they when or later on when ram is fighting the war he is shooting again and again at ravan's head but ravan's head is reappearing again and again then finally vibhishan comes and tells him he is doing his best to bring ravan down but that is not working then someone else helps him so we could say it is things which are in beyond his control that also working out right so vibhishan tells him shoot his head will keep reappearing no shoot in his heart shoot it and that's how he fells around so we can see that in his narlila also this principle applies okay any other questions so thank you very much shla prabhu pad ki gaur bhakta vrind ki hai gaur prema anand